Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Michael Wade, who is with the Por Portland People's Budget Project as well as Solidarity Against Austerity Group. So welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. Right, yeah. Talk about the Portland uh, People's Budget Project. What is that? Uh, well, we're a group that uh, started uh, out of the Occupy movement. Uh, uh, during, during that period, we felt that it was important to start uh, understanding what the economic pressures were. And so we got a group together and started studying, uh, and, and largely in response to a, a bunch of moves being made by the city to uh, start cutting budgets. And there was a, a very well announced uh, plans to cut $15 million from the budget of, this, of the city and, and uh, Mayor and, and Adams. I'm sorry, this is this year that was? That was last was year. La last and Mayor year. Adams okay. had asked for uh, 10, 8, and 6 percent budget cuts or something of that order. And a lot of the city bureaus were running around with like, you know, chickens with their heads cut off trying to figure out how to, how to do this. And, and this is the third or fourth time we've seen this in the past several budget cycles. The city always comes up with this kind of thing. So we, we decided that we needed to get in and start studying it and understand what, what's going on and how we can possibly stop doing this activity. So the, the, the uh, People's Budget Project came out of that. And so we've been meeting for the past year and a half or so, uh, usually uh, every other week uh, where we plan actions. Um, and then once a month we have a study group on weekends where we take on a particular subject. Uh, the kinds of subjects we've looked at in the past are uh, worker empowerment uh, moves, um, uh, where there's something called participatory budgeting that's been practiced in other municipalities around the world. And so we've, you know, that kind of stuff, that's what we're studying. Uh, we recently had a presentation on uh, worker-owned cooperatives mm -hmm. and that, that kind of stuff. And then um, out of that group, uh, that tends to be more of a study kind of group. Uh, the Solidarity Against Austerity group is a group of people that are actually trying to affect change in the budget now. And so right now, uh, uh, Mayor Hales is talking about a $21 million shortfall fall in the budget that could be as hot big as $25 million. And he's asking for all of the departments to do cuts again. And we actually think that there's, that's not the problem. You know, okay. there, are, there are several places in the budget where you can see money sitting there. And so we're, we're actually asking that the city what, do what we call as bake a bigger pie. And that is to uh, increase revenues and go after the people who actually have the revenues to, uh, for us to tax, and that is uh, corporations that are paying really uh, abysmal tax, uh, tax rates, and uh, the very wealthy who have actually received all of the gains of the past, of the economic uh, period from 1980 until now. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, so b baking a bigger pie, really means increasing tax revenues? Is that, is that what, what we're talking about? Uh, yes, that's, that's, the, uh, that's one of the uh, meetings of it. The other is to realize that the pie we have right now has a lot of air in it. <laughs> and so we need to, to go after it. There, there are a couple of places where we have sinks that are in the budget. Uh, one of those is called an internal service fund. And those are reserve funds that the city sets up in case emergencies arise. And uh, sometimes if they have to have deferred purchases over many years, they accumulate monies for that. Um, a lot of what we've seen is that in the, in the period of the economic crisis, starting in 2008 up until now, there's been a real reluctance to go into those sinks of money to, to deal with the uh, budget problems that we're having. Uh, with, with minor exceptions. Like, I don't know if you all remember, but last year, at the end of the budget cycle, suddenly Mayor Adams found $8 million to give to the school district. It was like, and so what we're saying is, yeah, those sinks are out there. This is a crisis time. This is when we should be using those sinks to take care of our employees and our, the services that our government delivers. Uh -huh, yeah, so if you, go into those sinks now to fund current needs, mm -hmm. then do you just, are you just postponing the crisis? Uh, 
that's that is a that's certainly one approach to uh, that you could take. But what do, how do you define a crisis? You know, we we we've had ups and downs, and these are cyclical problems that come into the budget, and so we need to recognize that they are cyclical, and the fact that we had uh, that tremendous. Uh, uh, financial crisis come on uh, into all of the government budgets from the federals down to the state and then it was passed down to the uh, to the local uh, uh, city uh, those um, you know that it's it's kind of like one or twice you know once or twice we need to spend that money in that way and we wouldn't expect to have to do it next year as the recovery builds and we've we've started seeing recovery now the problem with recovery is Recover recovery is tending to be in the financial sector, which is one place where we can't seem to get our hands on the money because of the way the rules are being written by corporations at the uh, uh -huh. federal and state level. Yeah. yeah. So, so is it is it possible for the city to get their hands on that money? There is some. Uh, yeah, there is. I mean, the, the in in the especially in the sink accounts and in we have a we have a policy in the city uh, called uh, uh, urban renewal where we're improving a lot of uh, uh, properties around the city. Uh, and it's relying on a particular kind of financing called tax increment financing. And that is a debt, it's a de debt financing vehicle. Uh, but the, uh, that vehicle builds up money in urban renewal areas that can then be applied to new building projects in that urban renewal area. So, uh, so just just for yeah. people that may not, urban renewal areas are specific areas that are designated um, by the city as being urban renewal areas, and the the taxes which normally would be generated through property taxes are are spent only on improvements in that area. Is that is that right? Yeah, it's a it's actually a very that's that's well put. I mean the. What happens in urban renewal, especially when using tax increment financing, because there are other ways to finance projects in urban renewal, but one of the big tools that they use is this thing called tax increment financing. And what it says is we take the urban renewal area and we just put a flat line on the tax revenue that can be collected for the general fund from that urban renewal area. And all of the improvements that go into that urban renewal area and the tax base that grows out of that urban renewal area is captured under a, a rising curve as, as the uh, tax receipts from that area imp increase, all of the money over that initial baseline tax revenue is put into a special fund for development projects. It, does, it never goes to servicing uh, the projects that have been built. Uh, it, it's just for building new projects. The trouble with that is, is as that urban renewal area grows and becomes more complex, servicing needs in that also grow. So what we do uh, is we borrow money from the rest of the budget to take care of that servicing area. And you know that's, that's one of the issues. Now there have been some tweaks that people have tried to that, but for the most part, that's the way it's working. And that, you know, so in those urban renewal areas, we actually do have a lot of money that's built, been built up in these funds. So like in Chicago, um, they've actually come up with a scheme where they, they, they identify idle pockets of money in urban renewal areas. So if you, have accumulated, say, $20 million or $5 million, in the case of Chicago, in an urban renewal area, and you haven't applied it to a new project, that's considered surplus money, and they take it back to the general fund. Uh -huh. So there are a, a number of techniques that we could approach, you know, take on that. Now, uh, it's not very popular uh, among a lot of our, our, our compatriots in this movement to talk about urban renewal that way, because those are good jobs. Those uh -huh. are good construction jobs. And um, so, you know, we 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 tread lightly on that on that piece of the equation. But it is one of the places where we have a sink of money that could be accessed, and possibly, you know, since it's in a crisis mode, we could put it back if we wanted to, uh -huh. at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and uh, put put the city of Portland into a larger picture because mm -hmm. you know, austerity is a national. Project of the it's corporate actually elite. A, it's actually actually an international project and of the corporate that was elite. The rest, <laughs> that was exactly the rest of my statements. So uh, yeah. In fact, uh, the you know the name austerity is actually coming out of uh, Europe, uh, where the EU has imposed these very stern measures 
on some of the underperforming economies over there like Greece and Spain. Um, and uh, unlike this country, you know, when they when they impose those kinds of uh, measures over there, they actually get a response. <laughs> People get really upset. Yeah, uh -huh. and are in the streets and, and and rioting and the like. Over here, it's been a very slow, kind of frog in the boiling water approach uh -huh. uh, to austerity, but it still exists here, and it's actually existed since uh, roughly the 80s up until now. And what has been happening in that period is that we've seen an explosion of income and that income has been taxed at a lower rate creating huge sinks of wealth and uh, that is you know since the state of Oregon uh, runs all of its uh, taxing structure off of the federal taxing structure the effect of that has been to uh, really reduce tax rates on very wealthy people uh, at the height of the of World War II, uh, tax rates, the effective tax rates on millionaires was like 63.5%. Uh, we always talk about the 90%, but there's always been an effective tax rate, uh -huh. and it's the effective tax rate that's important. And over the course of the last uh, 40 years, that, that, or I guess it's 50 or 60 years f from the height of World War II, uh, that tax rate has gone down to where it's now uh, in the, you know, if you're, uh, really well off. It's a, if you make a half a million dollars, you're being taxed at 39 percent. Now, if you make all of your money by by moving money around, it's 14 percent. Right. And so the, the <laughs> so that 14 percent is what you refer to as an effective tax rate versus right. the 39, which is what the official tax rate is. Right. But that people don't actually pay. Well, some people well, pay some it. People pay some it. Some people pay you it. You and I probably pay it. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, potentially. I we mean, could pay it. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah, unless right. we had a really good accountant, uh, we would be paying it. Uh, well, we could someday be paying it. Uh, yeah, right. I'm not in that category uh, right I'm, now. I <laughs> assure you I'm not either. <laughs> <laughs> but I would love to be in that category. Uh, right. um, so anyway, what what's happened with the... Uh, there are there are a lot of studies that are out in in the workplace and you and, and it, or in the uh, information sphere uh, that it, that show the power of the economy over time. And so sen since 1945, and you know this graph, the uh, there is plenty of money graph. What we're talking about is that since 1945, you can see a steady progression in the the growth of wealth in the economy. And such that in the last several years, it's like five trillion dollars is being added to the economy every year. The problem with that that wealth is it's being concentrated. And so, if you look at uh, other graphs, and we have a uh, a graph of incomes, and what it's showing is uh, so graph number eighteen for our purposes uh -huh. here. Um, the 0.1 percent is really the the group that's getting all of the money. We have, uh, you know, I have a number of um, different studies that show graphs of income distribution, and uh, we'll always see. You can see in the papers all the time. They'll say the top 20 percent is getting this. Right, but if you uh -huh. if you if you take the top one percent out of the top 20 percent, again the top one percent graph is going up, and the 20 percent graph is pretty flat. And if you even go into that one percent and do the same thing with the point one percent, it gets it, it gets uh, it's the same same effect. Right. And so so that's the bottom what line is here. what that what what all of these graphs are saying is that since uh, roughly 1980, we've had an absolutely flat income structure for the vast majority of people. Anyone in the 80 percent and below, flat to declining in relative incomes, and the people in the upper 20 percent, stratified in various ways have had an explosion of, of, of income. At the same time that was going on, we started cutting tax rates. And so the, the poor have always, you know, have always paid an exorbitant uh, tax rate. And the working man, because of his contributions to um, all of his income being taxed uh, for uh, Social Security and Medicare, is paying a much higher re effective rate than, than a very, very wealthy person. Um, so that what that does with the higher incomes and the and the exploding incomes and the declining tax rates creates a real wealth gap, such that now uh, ninety. I'm gonna go to, go to my graph. Yeah. 
Um, hang on here. So the bottom 80% of our population owns 77% of the wealth in the country. And, and when you look at this, uh, this graph, you can see that the top 1% owns 42% of the wealth. And that's just, you know, it's, it's just amazing. And it's gotten worse, it's not getting better. Right. Uh, this is something that changes over time, but uh, in the past decade, we've actually seen this thing explode. Mm -hmm. and, and get so that, so that the top 1% are getting a larger and larger increase, larger and larger amount of, of the wealth and the income. Yeah, the yes, and, um, and, and so consequently, the consequence of that is to say that the that the bottom ninety nine percent are getting less and less. Yes, relatively speaking, right. and actually, absolutely speaking. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. you know, they, so they, their their big sales pitch to us is that well, that the improvements in technology make your life better, so you can take less income. You know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's that's the argument. Okay, right. Uh, it's it's uh, you know, and there. And of course, th of course, the really really wealthy don't have that benefit. I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what happens is with this ex this um, concentration of wealth and uh, it, it actually ends up being just a concentration of wealth at the end of the day. That means that those people have money, disposable income, and disposable wealth that they can distribute in unproductive ways for the, for the democracy that we live in. Yeah. They tend to... But the problem is that we've decreased the tax rates on them. Uh, yes. Both the, both the uh, official tax rates and the effective tax rates. Uh, absolutely. In terms of well, we gave gave them more income and then lowered their tax rate. Right. Okay. It's a, it's a two-edged sword, and right. that and they go together uh -huh. to create this disparity of wealth. Right. Um, and so what that does is, in the end, is it introduces uh, a factor in our political process because of uh, moves that have been made in the Supreme Court to identify corporations as people and money as speech. Uh, that wealth now is distorting our political process uh -huh. and creating a, uh, you know, that's creating this this mantra about austerity. You know, that it's like we don't have enough; we need more, and you guys need to take cuts. We so we need to cut government services, and so we can accumulate more wealth faster. Right. That's yeah. that's, that's the, uh -huh. the the end event. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and the 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 consequence of all this is that. The wealthy get wealthier, the taxes which they are required uh, to pay or which they effectively pay to the state uh, decrease. Uh, the poor and the middle class uh, have stagnant wages and so in a consumer society such as we have, which is dependent on those middle class and poor people actually spending their money. Uh, they don't have any money to spend. Yeah, it's a, it's a demand vacuum is uh -huh. what's being created by the uh, you know, by that by that situation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, so the um, wanted to go. You know, one of the one of the places where we're seeing this uh, decrease in tax rates is in corporations. If you look at uh, taxes over time, there's a class of taxpayer, uh, basically entrepreneurs doctors and lawyers and things like that, uh, up to a point, you know, not, not the high-end lawyers, but uh, over time, their tax rate, their effective tax rate has stayed fairly steady. Uh, over time, the effective tax rate of corporations has taken a nosedive. So in the 1980s, uh, in Oregon, the effective tax rate on corporations was 16%. Uh, in 2010, the effective tax rate in Oregon for corporations was 6%. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's another place where we're seeing uh, revenues to the government just be decimated. Uh, in terms of a percentage of um, con you know, contribution, so working people, W-2 uh, payers, their contribution to the, the federal budget over time has gone from roughly 15% up to 40%. Corporations have gone from forty percent down to fifteen percent. Right. Yeah. That's the okay. you yeah. know that's the thing. So the basically the working person is picking up the corporation tax tab. 
Uh, and, it's, and, and so while we you you use you know some figures from Oregon, those are pretty much reflected nationwide, absolutely, and probably worldwide. Uh, yeah, worldwide is kind of a harder nut to crack sure. because it's a lot hard of to analyze. a lot of right. well, and a lot of the European countries have pretty hefty redistribution policies already. Uh -huh. uh, the austerity, you know, they're they're using austerity in Europe to actually break those those good social contracts that people in Europe have have uh -huh. gen have, uh, have won over time, and you know that's part of the 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 response that they're getting is going after those. Um, um, you know, going after those social contract programs has really engendered a response from the population uh -huh. of Europe, yeah. and such that we, you know, we don't have here. We every time the con Congress starts going after Social Security, they get some kickback, but it's not the kind of thing we're seeing in Europe. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, do, do you have a feeling for why that is? Uh, yeah, uh, we are, our union movement has been uh, devastated, and it was, and it's actually been a a, a a long-term project of uh, the, uh, you know, the National uh, Business Roundtable uh, has gone after this in a very methodical way, re rolling back laws and uh, uh, weakening the union movement all, all the way uh -huh. across. And so we saw in, la in the last couple of years uh, real uh, attacks in Michigan and Wisconsin on labor unions. Uh -huh. And right. uh, so, yeah, th so we've we've. You know, weakened our weakened our union movement, and so the only really decent unions we have left appear to be in public services, right. the, the teachers union, and and uh, you know, ask me and people like that. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, yeah, and of course, you know, as union membership has gotten concentrated just primarily in the public sector, uh, <laughs> public workers sector, then the rest of the population has felt like. They are just in it for themselves and are being selfish, uh, um, uh, right? And they are, and they basically are the people who saved the economy. Uh, the fact that we didn't permit these attacks and these, uh, you know, the the government went out and really made a point of saving a lot of government jobs because mm -hmm. that was the only demand engine we had at the height of the recession, right. and. These these cries to you know come in and and go after government services just is so wrongheaded. It's it's phenomenal. Uh, yeah, and, right, yeah. <laughs> and but you know it it sells because you can say, well I can you know I pay my bills. Why can't you pay yours? Kind of right, stuff. Uh, and, yeah. And uh, so that's the uh, what I feel is going on. Yeah. Yeah. So so you you've outlined what's happened nationally to create this uh, call for austerity mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of the realities behind that. And you talked a little bit about some of the, how that has played out here in the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. um, what's being planned to counter that? Well, I mean, as I you know I said at the beginning of the uh, of the event. Uh, we actually have in the People's Budget Project. There is a long-term goal that we would like the city to do with something that's called uh, participatory budgeting. Because one of the problems we have in uh, in not trusting government is that the people don't feel like they they did the budget. They feel like some bureaucrat down at City Hall did the budget, and they're tr they're right about that. There are we we spend a lot of money having people at City Hall put together budgets for us, mm -hmm. uh, and they are slightly informed by uh, people who are in the industries and a couple of citizens who are picked for their their um, knowledge and you know their their um, I, I want to say something nice here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know their connections. Okay, mm -hmm. and and so they. Uh, so that group, but it's kind of like you know foxes and hen houses. They're they're in there together, and the standard citizen doesn't feel like they've contributed, and so we think that participatory budgeting is the way to go, uh -huh. and that's a long-term uh, thing. But short term, we think that we need to uh, resist uh, very strongly, and so we have uh, an event coming up. The, the the final budget meeting of the year is May 16th um, at, at down at City Hall. And uh, we're going to have the Solidarity Against Austerity group, which is trying to stop cuts as opposed to, you know, uh, build a better budget. 
we're trying to stop what's being uh, proposed, and we're it's called uh, bake a bigger pie, and we're Maybe trying. We a bake a bigger pie. <laughs> bake a bigger pie, okay. Uh, which is to say that we think that you know, you're know you proposing cuts and we don't think you need to have the cuts. You should be looking at revenue sources. Uh -huh. right. and, okay. uh, and, and using the money that we've given you and you, you've put into these reserve accounts and you've got stuck in urban renewal, there are places to find the money to uh -huh. fully fund the services that people need. Because that's one of the issues. I mean, you, when you go to these, um, I don't know if you've been to one of the city budget project you know, budget meetings, but uh, they come in and basically say we have to cut 20 millions out of the budget, and so any group that wants to talk to us about why we shouldn't do that, you can talk, uh -huh. right, and uh -huh. and then uh, we'll pick winners and losers later on, uh -huh. and uh, that's really a negative. Uh, negative event if they instead of doing so that had the, the citizens the, yeah so they've really identified the the objective which is to cut 20 million dollars yeah uh, right and the question is who's going to get hurt right but somebody's going to get hurt so and we want to expand that conversation so that we look at how do we not make those cuts yeah yes and every every year it's the same thing we're going to cut your community center we're going to cut student bus passes we're going to cut summer job programs for uh -huh. kids I mean, it's you know, it's red herrings. Okay. So details, <laughs> details on this meeting on on May. Well, we're having it's called a potluck and protest. Uh -huh. It's going to be at City Hall, um, and it's uh, May sixteenth at five p.m. down at City Hall. And just come down there, bring uh, a, a pie if you can, <laughs> uh, but otherwise bring something healthy to eat, uh -huh. and we'll we'll be uh, uh, rallying and and uh, ex, you know expecting to. Make an impression on the people okay. inside City Hall. Okay. Thank you, Michael, for being Thanks, here. Thanks, David. All right. <laughs> Great. Our guest today has been Michael Wade, who is with the Portland's People's Budget Project, as well as Solidarity Against Austerity Group. Learn more at either of their websites, portlandwiki.org slash CA slash continuations or www.solidarityagainstausterity.org. Populous Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populous Dialogues. Click on the link with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on the sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. I want to thank the volunteers who donate their time to get us on the air. Uh, so thank you to Roger Bates, Beth Kerwin, Dave King, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And I want to thank all of you watching, and I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>